Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this newest episode of the Crazy Happy Podcast with me, Daniel Fusco, where we explore what does life look like at street level, where we all live, and what does it look like to walk that, what I like to call the crazy happy life, that life of fulfillment, where no matter how crazy or messy life gets, we have our lives rooted in Jesus, and we're responding to him in such a way that not only are we experiencing experiencing great happiness, but we're also sharing that happiness with other people. Thanks so much for being a part of this community. Thank you for your rating the podcast, letting people know about it, posting up about it. And also thank you so much to all of you. So many of you are super excited about the new book, Crazy Happy, Nine Surprising Ways that live to Live the Truly Beautiful Life that you can find wherever you like to buy books and all the different mediums that you like to get your books, whether it's an ebook or a print book, or an audio book, you know, where we explore the Beatitudes and the fruit of the spirit and God's plan for human happiness. I always say it. I love what I get to do, but I really love doing this podcast because when I get to do the podcast, I get to bring on friends and, and leaders, authors, people who I love, who I respect, who I admire, people whose the way God uses them is unique and I just get blessed by it. And I also love to get to talk to my friends on these. And, and so today I am super excited because my good friend Dominic Doan is joining me today on the podcast. Dominic is a pastor and he is an author of an amazing book called When Faith Fails about faith and doubt. And he is the pastor of Westside, a Jesus church in uh, Beaverton, Oregon, which is uh, south and uh, a little bit west of me, uh, but in my neighborhood. And he's just a great friend and a super awesome dude. Dominic, welcome to the Crazy Happy Podcast. How's it going, bro? It's going so well, man. Thank you for inviting me on. Well, I love this so much because not only did you get a chance to preach at Crossroads this past weekend, but we had lunch like a week ago, uh, maybe like two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, it was just you know, just recently. And so now, just to get to hang out again with all sorts of people watching and listening in, talking about who Jesus is mm-hmm. and and what He's doing. So one of the things that I, I want to just jump right into this. So yeah. so you, God is doing a unique thing in your life and your family right now. As you're t- you're taking a kind of a, a what would some people would consider a wild step of faith, talk share with people like okay this is what's happening right now and and mm-hmm. the steps that I'm taking right now. Yeah, you know I, I think life so many times can feel like a compass. I was thinking about this earlier today where we kind of have the the north star, we have God that's guiding us, we have the south what He's illuminating in our life and and the the joys that He gives us, but then we also have kind of the the parts of our life that are rising and the parts that are setting. <laughs> just like the sun. And this has been a season for us, for me, my family, where God's been giving us new vision, new dreams, new desires for the future, and also kind of setting the sun on a a chapter, a season. So we've been here in Portland, Oregon for uh, about nine years. Um, One of those years was uh, planting a church in North Carolina, kind of a long story there, Um, but seven years uh, as a lead pastor of a church. And it's been incredible. We've loved this season love this city. Um, but over the course of the last couple of years, God's just given us a vision and a, a desire um, to step more into the space of where people are doubting and struggling with their faith and helping people uh, find deeper faith in, in Jesus. And so we started a ministry just recently, a nonprofit called Pursuing Faith. And uh, in that ministry, we're going to be putting out podcasts and literature and videos, just helping people who are going through seasons of deconstruction find their way back to God. So good. And, and you know, as, as somebody walking alongside like myself and Cross, we're super excited to support you and, and, and be a part of what you're doing. And, and th- there's not a more relevant topic right now yeah. in Christianity and in and in the West and in the world than this idea of deconstruction. You know, uh, really, it's the it's the trendy term for people walking away from their faith in yeah. Jesus. So, 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 and, and your book, when faith fails, is a very important resource for people because in it you deal with the questions of doubt, but also you don't you don't romanticize it as the way our culture does, uh, yeah. and even the way some segments of Christianity does, where they think, oh, this is like a brave thing. But you're yeah. like, what does the Bible say about yeah. seasons of doubt? So, so talk a little bit about the book, and then we'll talk about the deconstruction. But I want you to really kind of yeah. help people understand what's When Faith Fails all about. 
Totally. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, I put on a book with Thomas Nelson. And in this book, I wanted to share, first of all, uh, my story, how I went through a season of deconstruction and reconstruction, what that looked like, some of the things I learned in the process, some of the pitfalls to watch out for. Um, but I wrote it more importantly to help people who are in that space of deconstruction. And you nailed it, man. Like something's happening right now. And I'd say especially over this last year, even last six months, we're seeing so many people deconstruct their faith, walk away from the faith, say that they don't believe. And I think in many ways, it's because we don't know how to respond uh, to doubt in our life. Um, part of it's bad theology, part of it's cultural assumptions that we carry into our walk with Jesus. But I think there's there's two dangers when it comes to doubt. One is to demonize our doubt. And, and that is where we see doubt is the great enemy. And so we're taught, you know, just suppress your doubt, just believe God is good all the time. And so we don't know what to do with thorny, gritty, raw, unanswered or unanswerable questions. And so in that space, um, and I, I kind of came from a church background years ago growing up where I was kind of taught that, where if you have questions or doubts, you just got to kind of press it down because that's not of God. Doubt's always a sin. But, but I don't think that's true. I, I think doubt can lead to a place of sin, which is unbelief. Unbelief is a sin, but doubt's kind of the neutral space in between that can lead to deeper faith or can lead to deeper unbelief. But I think the second unhealthy response to doubt is not just demonizing doubt, but like you said, what we're seeing in our culture is to idolize our doubt. And this is where we see doubt is really the answer. Let's deconstruct our faith. Um, and, and it's not just an issue of faith. Um, what we're seeing culturally right now is a deconstruction of all forms of institutions and authorities. And uh, wh wh whether that's things that we see systemically in our nation or politically, and that's being carried now into the church. And, and so the trendy thing right now is, hey, we got to deconstruct our faith, walk away from the faith, walk away from the church. But the problem with that is while I think deconstruction can can be healthy if it's a kind of a sloughing off of things that are unhealthy in our life, uh, views of God that aren't correct, um, things that we've kind of taken on board that aren't essential to our faith. That form of deconstruction can be really healthy. But if it's just deconstruction for the sake of deconstruction, it's not going to lead you anywhere. Like I'm, I'm in, in an office right now. I could deconstruct it. I could take off the roof and the walls and, you know, rip things apart until I'm just standing on the dirt. Okay, well, that might be okay for a season in summer months, right? <laughs> then winter's gonna roll around or because we're in the Portland area pretty much every day. Um, you know, we're gonna need shelter. We're gonna need a place to live. And, and in life, while seasons of deconstruction can be helpful or even fruitful if it leads to a revived flourishing faith, if it's just deconstruct for the sake of deconstruction, well, sooner or later, you need a worldview. Sooner or later, you need something that's going to keep you warm from the storm. Sooner or later, you're going to need a, a, a metric uh, that will guide your life. It's really powerful. You know, and, and and talk a little bit about this because I'm so aware of the fact that right now, like, you know, it, it seems like it is very fashionable. It's very trendy, you know, to, to be deconstructing, you know, uh, whereas, you know, where we live, we're seeing people say yes to Jesus for the very first time people who are coming out of all these different backgrounds and they're and they're yeah. committing their life to Jesus and starting the journey but for people within the church it's like it's becoming yeah. like and the church almost celebrates when people are like 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 in yeah. in the name of being loving they're like <laughs> right. man this is so great that you are apostatizing yeah. like that like right. like you're you're walking away from your savior mm. and we should we should be like you're brave and 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 so mm. and, and we live in such a world that is so like conformity is such a strong thing yeah. especially now like you know as people talk about things like cancel culture like everyone yes. just it's it's the the digital mob has such mm -hmm. a sway on people's lives and so i was just talking to a young person recently and they were and they were working through some things and like they're like you know i i just think maybe i should just walk away from my faith i'm like well you know you would be going along mm -hmm. with everybody else right now like it's like i'm yeah. like you realize that like yep. that's not a break you're just like you're just following the current of culture and, yeah. and and they just kind of looked at me. I'm like, so if you just want to be that way, like just be with the, yeah. just be like a, you know, love and pop music and just being like everybody else. Like you can be a cookie cutter <laughs> of the culture. And I'm like, but I'm like, but Jesus is always inviting us through the narrow gate. Yeah. Well, on the I mean, difficult you, way, you know? Yeah. The flip side of that, which I think 
should give us hope is that now the truly edgy thing is to follow Jesus. So you want to be countercultural. You want to be different. You want to stand out. You want to be uh, someone who's re revolutionary. Then follow the carpenter from Nazareth. <laughs> and so I think there's there's a there's a beauty in this secular time in which we live. Um, there's some cracks in, in, the, in the secularism that I think the seeds of the gospel can be planted in. But you're right; like it, it is becoming more of a trendy thing. Um, and sad to say, many many people are applauding loss of faith. They're saying, "Yeah, go for it, deconstruct your faith, walk away from the church. It's all dumb anyway." And I don't think that should be our response. Um, in Jude 22, it says, "Be merciful to those who doubt." And the word mercy there is this ancient Greek word. You probably know this, like it means to repair a broken bone. And so if someone just broke their bone and they're in agony in front of you, your response is not, yay, you broke your bone. That's awesome. Go, let's go break a few more. No, you're like, oh man, you, you, you feel compassion. You feel empathy. You're not judging them. Like some people in the church will judge those who are deconstructing or doubting. You're not judging them. You're not kicking them out you're of the church or a safe place. You're, you're the doctor kneeling beside them saying, hey, how can I help you? And I think the most loving thing we can do for someone who's deconstructing or walking away from the faith, it's not judging them, it's not isolating them, but saying, how can I love you through this? How, how can I walk with you through your season? Of, of doubt because doubt's greatest strength is secrecy. And I think this is this is how the enemy, by the way, loves to work in our life. He, he just loves to cause us to, to withdraw from others, to put up walls, but it's in that place of secrecy that it, it kind of grows, it becomes malignant. And so I think the healthiest way that we can work through seasons of doubt or deconstruction is in community actually, to say, hey, to trusted people, spiritual advisors, pastors, people in our life who maybe are further along than us, just say, you know, I'm wrestling with these issues. Um, could, could you be a friend right now who can help me through it? Um, and, and as we wrestle together in community, like Jesus did, by the way, with his disciples, Thomas doubted, Jesus didn't abandon him. He said, touch my wounds. If, if we're there alongside those people, that's how their deconstruction can actually turn into a reconstruction that's redemptive. Now let's talk about this. Cause like you're really touching on something I think is so important. That idea of being able to process through your doubts in relationships with, with people. But earlier you had said that, mm -hmm. you know, the two make big mistakes that we make is you, we, we either mm -hmm. demonize doubt or we idolize yeah. it. Right. So, mm -hmm. and for lots of folks, you know, they're in churches where doubt is demonized. Yeah. So like, like for, so for someone who feels like, man, like I have all these doubts, but I'm not in yeah. an environment where I can like, really like, I don't have any, mm -hmm. like if I go to the pastor, he's gonna be like, oh man, that's just doubt. That's just un lack of faith. It's sin. Forget yeah. that. You know, like, like, what does that, what does somebody do in that situation? Cause like, I, I think one of the things that you said mm -hmm. was really, you know, that, that you're, you're talking about is really powerful is that like, because God is infinite and we're all finite. Yeah. Like we yeah. all have things that we just don't really understand. There is, mm -hmm. you know, you have to embrace the, some of the mystery. There's a lot of things the Bible tells us, and there's a lot of things the Bible mm -hmm. doesn't tell us. And there's, a, and, and as much as I know mm -hmm. God and I trust him, as much as I believe in Jesus and I do, there's all these things about Jesus that I just don't really understand. Yeah. Doesn't make a lot of sense. I believe what the word says, but I don't know how this all works. So, so for somebody who's in an yeah. environment where doubt is demonized, but they're struggling, mm -hmm. they have these questions. What would be your encouragement or your recommendation for them? Yeah, I think my encouragement would be, first of all, you're not alone. You might you might feel like you are. You might find yourself in a church environment or a spiritual context. You're like, man, I'm the only one who has questions. What's wrong with me? And that's just not true. And the reason I know that's not true is, well, open your Bible. And the Bible is filled with men and women who are in that space of doubting, struggling. I mean, David, how long, O oh Lord, in the book of Psalms, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why do the nations you know, who are evil flourish and thrive, but the righteous are struggling? Like all these gritty questions. And so we got to realize like, while culture is painting doubt as something is like, oh, we're edgy now. We're asking these difficult questions. Well, actually, this comes from scripture. <laughs> the scripture is filled with it. In fact, Jesus' primary way of, of discipling was through the asking of questions. Um, someone added it up once. It's like over 300 times Jesus asked his followers questions. Who do you say that I am? Um, 
you would talk to Peter and, and try and draw truth out of him as he was wrestling at different points. Same with Thomas. So all these questions that are found in scripture, that was how Jesus caused us to open up within our own assumptions. So I think this is really important. If someone's listening to this right now and they feel that they're alone, you aren't. There are so many people who are in that space. And I think the, the recommendation is sometimes Sometimes I think we can find ourselves in a, a toxic church culture where we're not given the space to wrestle, where when we break our bones spiritually, um, instead of finding a place where, of acceptance and embrace and how can we help you through this, we find judgment and cynicism. And in those times, we may want to consider, okay, is there a community that I can be a part of? Our, a good place to start is just who's in my, my friendship circle that I can be real with and call up, FaceTime, go for a walk with, start there, right? Because I think it's in that those intimate places. Jesus had 12 disciples and then of the 12, he had three. And of that even had one, John, right? Um, we have those people in our life that God has brought to us that we can open up, we can share with. And from that place, then I think discernment comes. Yes, it's so important. And I think you said it earlier that really doubt can really take hold in secrecy. And I think one of the things that we've lost in a sense, uh, kind of culturally is the ability to bring, you know, to drag our stuff into the light, you know, Mm. to be able to say like, whether, whether it's, Hey, like I have these habits and, and they're not of Jesus. They're, they're not godly. And I, they bring me shame, but like until you drag them into the light and, and, and let Jesus do his work, in it and and use his people to help you know it, it has it has some some it's it's insurmountable in some ways and in the same way with yeah. doubt and so so how do you recommend to people to 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 be able to to f- take those first baby steps to bring the doubts into the open especially ones that have been nurtured so yeah. significantly <laughs> in secret yeah i i think step 1 is just really a reframing of the whole conversation so it, part part of the process I went through my deconstruction, reconstruction, writing the book, having conversations, thinking on this issue is I realized, wow, doubt isn't so much as an obstacle as it is an opportunity to grow. And just having that shift in perspective of like, okay, this isn't the end of my my faith, but this is actually a new chapter into a deeper form of faith. Um, because in the questions, we can discover deeper intimacy and relationship with God. So for example, like my wife, we've been married 20 years now. There is a ton I know about her. She's a morning person. She loves to garden. She loves to cook. Uh, She used to be a cat person and then she repented and we got a golden doodle. Like there's a lot I know about her, right? But that said, there are still times in our 20 years of marriage where she'll surprise me. She'll share a story from her past. I'm like, I didn't know that. Or I'll open up Spotify and see, whoa, you listen to that song. That's interesting. Let's talk about that. Right? There, there are times in our marriage where she'll open up and I'll learn things about her that I, that I didn't know. And the fact that there are things about my wife that I don't know, I wouldn't say is a problem. I would say that's actually a relationship in process. It's a, it's a journey. It's an adventure. In the mystery, there's beauty, right? And, and I think in our relationship with God, too, um, mystery is a lifeblood of intimacy. God allows us to grow in our faith. God allows us to grapple with things that we don't know the answer to. Because in that process, we're learning what it means to love. We're learning what it means to walk with him in relationship. I mean, if I knew everything about my wife, if I knew literally every placement of every atom, if I knew every thought she had, every word before she said it, if I knew literally where she was at any given second, that would be kind of creepy, right? It's because there's still mystery. It's because there's still unanswered questions. It's because there's still stories that come out. That's what makes the relationship alive. And I I think when it comes to doubts and questions, um, that, that is a gateway into intimacy. It's kind of God's way of saying, hey, there's still more to discover. There's still beautiful mountains to climb. There's still vistas to see. There's still places to worship. And just that that little reframing of seeing doubt as, oh, no, this is the end of my faith. I'm going to leave it all. Instead, oh, this is an opportunity to grow in my love towards Jesus. So I think that's step one right there. Well, and what you're talking about is so cool because 
really it, it goes back to the name of your new not for nonprofit pursuing faith that that really this relationship with God is what you're saying it, there there's a pursuit that needs to happen and yeah. and you're saying that even your questions even your doubts now are yeah. opportunities to to be pursuing who the Lord is, pursuing the Absolutely. Lord, pursuing faith. Yep, and we're, we're following Jesus. We're pursuing Jesus. To follow Jesus implies growth. It implies movement. It implies progression. It's anything but static. Jesus didn't say, okay, you're my follower now. Just stay where you are. Like Peter had to drop his nets, and he had to follow Jesus on this three-year journey that turned into a lifelong journey. Uh, to come and know and follow Jesus. And so too, for any disciple, if we're not moving, if we're not growing, if we're not evolving, well, by definition, then you're dead, right? Like there has to be some kind of movement, some kind of growth that's happening. If you have a heart beating inside of you, then there's going to be inevitable change. And so I think doubt actually can be, and I, even the word doubt, I think people get hung up on that because of all these negative connotations. Um, maybe we just need to look at it as opportunity or questions or uncertainty or mystery. And in that place, there is room to grow. Now, the, the flip side that needs to be said again is that doubt can be toxic if we don't handle it well. Doubt can lead us to a dark place uh, if we if we idolize it. Um, and see, so that's why I think conversations have to be had in the church, in podcasts like you're doing right now. Conversations have to be had about what what is doubt? What does scripture actually say about it? And how do we respond to it? You're listening to the Edify Podcast Network. We'll be right back. This podcast is part of the Edify Podcast Network. Edify is a faith-inspiring app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. Cut through the noise and grow your faith by diving into the world's top Christian podcasts today. Download the Edify app for free from the App Store or Google Play or by going to edify.app. That's E-D-I-F-I dot app. This is the Edify Podcast Network. Welcome back. Now, I, I think what's powerful that you're talking about is, is this idea that these questions are are important but i why do you think that we have a tendency to to want to that we get nervous that god wants to take us deeper it's like almost we end up with like this settler's faith like where it's like yeah. i know what i know and i believe what i believe yes. and like yes. i got it all together is it is it a human grasp for certainty would you say it's that or or like what causes us to kind of calcify where when those questions start coming in they either make us nervous or you yeah. know we just kind of try and dismiss them and pretend like it's not happening as if no we already understand it yeah, we, I mean, we love certainty and, and that especially comes out of a modernistic mechanistic, mechanistic mindset that was prevalent, you know, 1800s, 1900s. We've since moved on to a postmodern perspective where there is no such thing as certainty, but, but many of us still grapple with, um, man, I want things, I want my ducks in a row. And we, we kind of have a campers versus a pilgrims mentality. Right, we we get settled. We find where we're comfortable. I'm not moving. Right, I've read my book on 101 answers to difficult questions the Bible asks, and all the answers begin with the letter P. I've memorized a few things or listened to a, a few apologists or whatever, and we think, okay, I'm settled. But Christianity is really not just being about a, a camper. It's about being a pilgrim. We're moving. We're growing. We're grappling. We're wrestling. We're learning. Right. And, and I think that will continue and, until heaven, really. We see through a glass dimly, but someday face to face. And even this is slightly off topic, but I even wonder sometimes in heaven, like, I, I think there will still be growth. I, I think we'll still be learning things about God because if God is infinite, then there's infinite aspects of him to discover and learn. And I think there's a reason why every description of heaven in scripture has a worship and the casting of crowns at his feet because we worship what we admire, what we learn about, what we see. And the more we see, the more we want to worship. I think the more we grow, the more we learn about this infinite God. And because we're not infinite, we have a lot of place to explore, the more it inspires wonder in our life. Now, talk a little bit about the idea that 
it's important not to idolize doubt, mm, you know? And yeah. I, I think, I think what's amazing is, is especially when people are in the process of walking away from Jesus and deconstructing their faith, like they never think to doubt their own doubts. Like the, the, mm. they, they, they put full trust <laughs> in their doubts. And, and, yeah. I, and like, and I always tell people like, like I have to doubt my, like if, if I'm going to, if I'm going to ask questions, I also have to ask questions of my questions. Like, like yes. I, do I doubt my doubt? And so, so talk yeah. a little bit about, you know, wh- why, why we have a tendency that, especially for people, and talking about people who are people of faith, people who believe yeah. in Jesus, you know, yeah. why do you think we have a tendency to idolize doubt, and why do we not mm. actually question the very doubting that we do with the same veracity or intensity that we might question our faith in Jesus? Yeah, I think we have an impro- impoverished view of mystery and the role that mystery can play in our life. We we really idolize in many ways certainty, as you mentioned earlier. And because we don't find that certainty, which I think in many ways, certain levels of certainty are impossible until heaven, um, our, the, our allegiance of what we worship then shifts to, oh, then doubt must be the answer. And I'm going to doubt everything. And let's face it, like some forms of doubt is essentially a, a form of self-worship because we get a question, we get a thought, and we think, oh, I'm so smart that I have this. And we begin to prop that up above what scripture says is truth. And I think you nailed it. I think that comes from uh, an old, uh, I don't know if it was Jars of Clay. Yeah, but he he once said one of his songs, he said, you know, we need to doubt our doubts. And I think that that's true as well, that we need to actually ask, okay, what is this question? And a deeper thing is, what is this question pointing towards? Like, why why is this such a hang up for me why do i really struggle with the authority of scripture is it really because i have questions archaeologically is that really the the issue or questions about the the formation of scripture many times not not always but many times our doubts can be a cover for something that's going on in our life and we use our doubt maybe as an excuse why we're leaving the faith. So I'm leaving the faith. I, I talked to someone recently. I'm leaving the faith because, you know, I, the church is full of hypocrites. Okay, well, that's such a, a cliche answer, but let's talk about that. You dig a little deeper and you find, oh, okay, well, his parents just a couple of years ago went through a divorce and his dad a while back used to be a pastor. And so there's some very real hurt there because he's seeing what his parents are going through and now what his dad is doing, and he associates that with the ministry, right? There's always something that's going on. Um, the late Chris, Christopher Hitchens, who's one of the, was one of the world's most famous atheists when he was alive, and brilliant thinker, an interesting guy, um, came out with a book, Why, you know, Why Religion Poisons Everything, God is Not Great. Um, but then he started to learn about his story, and I found out, oh, well, his mom ended up having an affair with an Anglican priest. And at one one of his interviews, he's talking about that. And you wonder, okay, could there be something going on here psychologically that's actually causing him to, to question the faith or be angry or bitter towards the faith? So I think in many cases, we have to be honest, and it's an uncomfortable, it's an uncomfortable conversation, but we have to be honest about why we're doubting these things. Is it truly an honest intellectual question? or thing that we're we're wrestling through. If that's the case, great, let's talk about it. Let's read about it, let's study about it. But is there something beneath that? Or are you using your doubts, your questions uh, as an excuse to walk away? Because in reality, your heart has moved on into a different place. Or maybe there's a sin that you're wrestling with in private and you've given yourself over to that. Um, The mind won't believe what the heart won't obey. And if, if we're not really willing to, to follow the way of Jesus, then our mind will come up with all kinds of justifications and reasons why we don't want to do that. So answer me this, because like what you're talking about is very important, but you're also talking about a level of self, of introspection, of, mm-hmm. of you know, kind of, a, you know, self-dissection. You know, yeah. uh, uh, you know, an, a, a level of honesty that I think for many people, they're just not willing to go there. You know, yeah. it's like, like, cause we live it, we live in a culture that doesn't, you know, our culture doesn't value depth necessarily. You know what I mean? Like every once in a while, like a movie will be super popular, like, like inception where it's kind of like, it's yeah. a deeper movie. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But by and large, like our culture yeah. is, it doesn't value depth. Like every once in a while, like you hear a pop song, you like, oh, that's a cool, like, but, but it's not like there's like these really intricate songs that were like, wow. Like back in the day, mm. Bohemian Rhapsody was a popular song, which is right. a very intricate song, yeah. you know, but today they're like, no, no, the song's got to be three and a half <laughs> minutes. So like, we don't live in a culture that really values depth, but like, why do you think we, it's not just a culture. Why do you like, yeah. cause you're asking people to actually do some heart surgery, like, like mm-hmm. look in there and, 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 and be honest about what's really going on. Why do you think people avoid that? Oh my goodness. It's hard. It's, it's difficult to confront the shadows, the dark places of our heart. And I'm not saying that if you have doubt, there's always something sinister going on. Many times there isn't. Like I mentioned earlier, people in scripture, they had doubts and questions and they brought them towards God and it became a catalyst for deeper faith. But I'm saying there are there are times in our life when we use doubt as a justification for our lifestyle preference. And when that's the case, it is really hard, really difficult to acknowledge that and to admit that. But it's a real simple question. Okay, I have these doubts, but why? Why do I have them? Why is this such a hang-up for me? Why is this so such a difficult hurdle for me to overcome? And doing that difficult work can actually be very painful, but it can also be tremendously liberating. It's like it's a sunny day. It's a rare, miraculous sunny day here in Portland. If I stepped outside. You can see my shadow. Every shadow has a substance that it's pointing towards, right? I'm the substance, there's the shadow. Sometimes we get fixated on the shadow, right? If, if doubt's a shadow, sometimes that becomes the object of our affection, the thing that we idolize. But if I came home from work today and my wife came out to greet me and she's like, oh, it's so good to see you, sweetie. And then she fell down to the, the, the ground and started kissing my shadow and hugging my shadow. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm here's the substance, right? Here's the dom. Here's the reality. You're kind of missing it. And I think so too, when we get hung up on deconstruction, we get hung up on our doubts and like, oh, I'm worshiping, missing, kiss, kiss, hug, hug. We're kind of missing the substance that it's pointing to. So here's the question. What is the substance that the shadow of doubt in your life is pointing to? That can take some time. That I think that's best done in community. That's best done with people who know us well. Um, But in that difficult process, I think true faith, gritty faith, beautiful faith, raw faith, faith that is less about having all the answers and more about the fragile intimacy of trust, that's when it's born. I mean, C.S. Lewis, he, he once said, I think it was in his book, Till We Have Faces, he said, now I know, Lord, why you utter no answer. You yourself are the answer. And I, I love that because he wrote that. Out, coming out of a season in his life when he experienced loss, the death of his wife, Joy. And he had all kinds of doubts. I mean, read a grief observed. He says, God, I came to the door of prayer and I just got a slam door in my face. But what, what Lewis discovered is, oh, there's a substance here. There's something beautiful here in it. And it's not about having every answer. It's about discovering trust in God and discovering intimacy and relationship with God. That's where it's at. But we have to walk through sometimes the dark valley of examining and asking why, why we have doubts to arrive to that place. So good. So we just have a few more minutes together. Here's a question. If you could have the ear of all of your brothers and sisters in Christ, of of every stripe and style and, you know, and in this Mm -hmm cultural moment what's going on right now if if there was this one thing that you're like listen i would love for all of my brothers and sisters in christ to get our attention on this idea and not just jesus but like like this like if we would just grab hold of this this would really help us to embody the gospel in the world today so that we could be salt and light the way we were created to be what would that be yeah understanding that your faith is not dependent on how many answers you have to difficult questions. It's about realizing that relationship in Jesus is where it's at. And for those who are in a space right now where maybe they're getting caught up in deconstruction or leaving the faith, in one sense, I I get it. I understand the distrust in authority. I d- understand the distrust in churches. I mean, we're pastors. We see it from the inside. And it's hard and it's messy, but it's also incredibly beautiful. 
And what your soul is really longing for, I would say to someone, is, is not a faithless existence because you were made for more than that. You were made for intimacy and relationship with God. And don't abandon that in a cultural fad of deconstruction because the life with Jesus is the most beautiful life imaginable. It's an adventure. It's growth, it's change, it's evolution. It's him taking us further and deeper than we could ever imagine. It's like your book, right? It's, it's crazy happy. There's a joy that's found in following and pursuing Jesus that nothing else, no system, no worldview, no deconstruction can lead you to. And let, let Jesus be the faithful presence alongside of you in whatever season you're in. Beautiful. So Dominic, if people want to get your your book, When Faith Fails. And I know you're writing another one. If they want to be able to connect with you, uh, uh, yeah. find out about pursuing faith, where do people find you on the internet, on the social platforms? Where, where do we point people to so people can 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 get their faith encouraged and, and fortified with you? Yeah, simplest place is just to go to pursuingfaith.org. And there you can connect our social. My social is just Dominic Doan. Uh, there, there's a link to the book, link to the podcast and resources. So yeah, pursuingfaith.org. So good. Well, Dominic, thanks so much for n- not only being on the podcast and preaching at Crossroads, but for just being a great dude who I super appreciate our friendship and the discussions and the journey through life together. So bro, I just love you so much. Thanks so much, man. Thank you, man. Love you. And I so admire and appreciate the work you're doing. Well, everybody out there. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Crazy Happy with me, Daniel Fusco. Listen, we want to pursue faith in Jesus so that we can move through the world, sprinkling a little bit of happiness around. And when we do, God is glorified and people get blessed and the gospel grows in the world. So God bless you all. We'll see you next time. Take care and be well.